Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured presenter, Michael Bennon. Michael Bennon is a managing director at the Stanford Global Project Center, developing new initiatives for the GPC and managing their student programs and industry affiliations. Mike's research areas of interest for the center and work experience are in public sector finance, infrastructure and real estate, investment, and project organization design. Mike served as a captain in the U.S. Army and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for five years, leading engineer units, managing projects, and planning for infrastructure development in the U.S., Iraq, Afghanistan, and Thailand. Mike received a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the United States Military Academy at West Point and received an MSCE and MBA from Stanford University. And by the way, if you like what you're hearing today in Mike's presentation, you may also be interested in taking his Stanford graduate course on global project finance that's being offered this upcoming winter quarter. Mike will talk more about the class in a moment, but we want to flag that enrollment is currently open until December 11th. So feel free to visit the SCPD site to learn more about the course and enroll. And now I'll turn it over to Mike. Um, so I've got a lot of material to cover uh, in a short period of time, but uh, first I'll just take a couple minutes to plug my research pro program and, and the course. Um, so I work at the Stanford Global Project Center. Uh, so we're an interdisciplinary research center at the university, uh, and we kind of work uh, between the different uh, department silos at the university to uh, conduct interdisciplinary research. And our topic is on innovation in infrastructure finance and development. Uh, so we like to frame our research program as covering a broad spectrum. Uh, and on one end of that spectrum, we have institutional capital. Let me see if I can advance this. Okay. Uh, so on one end of that spectrum, we have institutional allocations to infrastructure. Uh, so an institutional investor, such as a pension fund or a sovereign wealth fund, uh, more recently, some of these institutional investors have created allocations to the asset class. So we do research uh, on that. Uh, trend uh, within the industry and the risks associated with infrastructure allocations. On the other end of that spectrum, we do work on um, government policies and practices in infrastructure development. So some of these include uh, procurement practices, what I'll be talking a little bit about today in the United States, and others include other topics include public policies in and around infrastructure development. And finally, we do case-based research on the projects in which that institutional capital is invested in infrastructure. Uh, and, and lastly, we also uh, have a program on innovation in infrastructure development and the trend uh, of cities towards participating in the digital economy. Uh, now for, for a quick uh, overview of my course, which is starting in January. Uh, so global project finance really um, covers that, that whole spectrum uh, of infrastructure development and project risk. So part of the course is focused on uh, the basics of project structuring and development, some of the concepts we'll talk about today. Um, and then we also have modules on project risk assessment and then a, a large module on infrastructure investment. Uh, so most of our class sessions involve a, a topical lecture by me and then a guest presentation from an industry executive, either uh, the head of a uh, public procurement agency for infrastructure or an infrastructure fund manager uh, or a project developer, uh, financial advisor, or even the manager of a pension portfolio. Uh, the course objectives are generally to prepare students for a career in, in project finance and infrastructure development uh, writ large. Uh, and for our assignment for the course, uh, we develop a financial model and a risk assessment uh, for an infrastructure project, and we develop components of it over the course of, uh, of the quarter. Uh, this year, it's going to be a, a toll road investment. So on to what project finance is. Um, so project finance involves the ring-fenced financing of an infrastructure asset um, based on the microeconomics of the project itself as opposed to the sponsor balance sheet or the, the city or, or government's balance sheet. Um, so infrastructure projects, they, they, they have a few distinct uh, tasks that are required to complete them and manage them over the long term. So they have to be designed, built, financed, and then operated and maintained. Um, under traditional infrastructure procurement, um, the government essentially hires companies to complete all of those tasks, um, or it uses internal staff to complete some of them, but it generally procures them separately and then manages the interfaces between those contracts. 
under um, a project finance, or as it's also referred to as a public-private partnership, or a P3, essentially the government procures one contract um, for a private partner to um, complete the, all of those tasks and then manage the interfaces between them. So governments usually use this procurement model. The, the prime driver is to transfer the risks of infrastructure development uh, to that private sector partner. So infrastructure projects are, are, are uh, some of the most risky enterprises that governments undertake. Uh, I like to bucket the risks uh, associated with infrastructure development uh, into, into three buckets. Um, so on one, it can, of course, uh, take much longer to build than expected and go way over budget, and those are commonly correlated. Uh, it can also cost more to operate and maintain the asset than the, than the, uh, the, originally, uh, the government originally forecast. And then finally, for projects that are funded by a user fee, uh, such as a toll road, um, there can be lower um, demand than what the government originally expected, so that could cause a lack of funding in the future. So governments, as I mentioned, generally use this procurement model to transfer risk to the private partner in developing and maintaining an asset. So there's a few criteria that we recommend uh, for governments or, um, or, or project sponsors to consider when they're assessing a potential project as a potential for um, project finance. Uh, so the first of those is, is uh, uh, simply scale. Larger projects uh, generally entail more risk, so this procurement model is, is really mostly suited to larger infrastructure projects. Uh, the second factor is uh, general project risk, so has the sponsor done one of these projects before? How did that go? Um, is this a particularly unique project where there might be um, significant O&M risk or construction cost risk? Uh, the third factor is uh, flexibility. Um, so because these uh, project finance generally entails a longer contract, um, uh, generally if there's uh, a need for flexibility due to technology change or other factors, this procurement model might not uh, be a good fit for that because it's generally used for longer term contracts. And then finally, the last factor is innovation. Uh, so this procurement model, uh, because it combines construction and operation and maintenance into one contract, there's opportunities for innovation for the contractor uh, that's building the asset because they have to both build it and operate and maintain it in the long term. So that means they might make decisions during construction to optimize for life cycle costs instead of just the initial cost to build the asset. So this slide shows uh, the many parties involved in a complex infrastructure project and how they relate to one another uh, uh, under a project finance structure. So generally a special purpose vehicle or an SPV is created with the sole purpose of building and maintaining the infrastructure project. The SPV will have equity investors, it will arrange for financing uh, to build the project, and then it will also uh, have contracts with the many contractors and or operators needed to build the project. It will also have a project development agreement with the sponsoring government. So on to our uh, topic for today. Uh, so uh, to get straight to the point, uh, this, this uh, procurement model uh, isn't used in the United States uh, at the same rate as it's used in other developing economies globally. So I like uh, Canada and Australia as good comparators to the US because they're also large landmass developed economies and federal democracies. Uh, and this chart um, shows uh, the, uh, the usage of this procurement model in Australia and Canada, both in terms of the capital attracted uh, and the number of projects compared to the U.S. Uh, so it's, it's pretty clear that it's used much less in the United States, which by population, of course, has a much larger economy than uh, Canada and Australia. So the question is, uh, why, why hasn't this model picked up in the United States? Well, I think this chart shows that it's not due to demand. Uh, so this chart shows uh, the, all of the transportation and social uh, infrastructure or uh, public-private partnerships that have been procured in the United States, um, and it, it's sourced from an industry publication. So the, tr the start of each of these bars indicates the start of the procurement process from the sponsoring government. So, uh, typically, uh, when a government uh, pursues one of these projects, it starts by issuing a request for qualifications, or RFQ, to potential 
companies that would compete for the project. Uh, the end of this bar is commercial close, or when the government effectively signs a contract uh, with that uh, infrastructure developer to then go and finance and then build the project. For the red bars, uh, that the end of the bar is commercial close, or the contract signing. For the gray bars, it's when the project was canceled. Uh, so I think this uh, chart indicates a couple of trends. One is that demand for this procurement model in the United States is certainly increasing. You can kind of see that because by the start of procurements kind of accelerating over time. Um, what's also very clear from this chart is that successful, pro excuse me, successful procurements are not uh, being completed uh, at that same rate. Um, so, uh, in general, this uh, procurement model does take a little bit longer to procure in the United States when you compare with other developed economies like Europe. Um, but what makes the U.S. particularly uh, unique is the prevalence of project cancellation. Uh, so you can see a lot of, a lot of gray on this chart. Um, so this chart uh, uh, further illustrates um, what I think is an explanation of this trend in the United States. So this shows a uh, breakdown of infrastructure spending, both by capital projects or spending for new infrastructure and operations and maintenance. Um, it's also broken down by the federal government and then our state and local governments. Uh, so I think this chart um, debunks a bit of a myth uh, about U.S. infrastructure. Um, so a lot of media reports uh, have indicated that you know, part of the problem with U.S. infrastructure is that essentially that politicians don't uh, prioritize infrastructure enough in the United States. And this indicates to me that this is only partially true, uh, mainly for our federal government. Um, state and local governments, uh, on the other hand, are actually increasing spending in real dollars to infrastructure, and they're particularly uh, increasing it to maintenance. Um, so there's been a big shift, essentially, in responsibility in the United States from primar pr spending primarily by the federal government to spending by state and local governments. This slide indicates um, uh, part of my explanation for why this procurement model uh, of using project finance hasn't picked up in the United States as it has in other developed economies. Um, so to explain this uh, rather quickly, um, this chart shows infrastructure spending over time both on capital projects and on, uh, on maintenance projects. And so we use an institutional uh, explanation for the unique um, circumstances of uh, infrastructure development in the United States as it relates to project finance. So essentially, what I mean by that is uh, a lot of our institutions, and by that I mean our public agencies for developing and maintaining infrastructure at the state and local level, were formed uh, during very high levels of spending by the federal government, and most of that spending was focused on capital costs. Now, federal spending is still primarily oriented towards uh, capital costs, um, but the, the, uh, the, the world uh, that we exist in in the United States is a much different place than what, uh, in the decades following World War II when heavy sp federal spending uh, was supporting capital costs. And, uh, and our public institutions were essentially designed for that world as opposed to uh, the situation that, that we're currently in with that um, broad shift in responsibility towards our state and local agencies. Um, so part of our explanation is, is that our public institutions in the United States, primarily at the state and local level, aren't really designed to manage procurements using project finance, which has to account for all of the life cycle costs uh, of, of an asset, as opposed to just capital costs, which are supported by the federal government. So this is my last uh, complex chart uh, for, the day, for today. Uh, so this is that same data on um, public-private partnerships, uh, transportation, and uh, social infrastructure, um, broken down by state. So the x-axis shows the number of uh, projects that have been procured. The size of each bub bubble is the relative amount of capital that the state's been able to attract uh, using this procurement model. And then the y-axis is the average procurement time uh, for projects in that state. Now, I use this chart to illustrate um, basically the power of institutional change for public agencies uh, in, um, in developing a new procurement model like project finance. So um, 
Every state that has procured more than one of these projects uh, essentially has undergone some form of institutional change in its um, public agencies. Uh, just to highlight a few, so Texas, Florida, and Virginia have all created um, P3 offices within their departments of transportation uh, with varying levels of autonomy. Uh, Colorado has created the High Performance Transportation Enterprise, uh, which procures projects in, in its state. Indiana created the Indiana Finance Authority, which has procured uh, all of its uh, P3s. And then the city of Long Beach is a pretty unique example, and it's actually our, our case study for this morning, um, has procured two of the last three uh, public-private partnerships in the United States just by, or excuse me, in California, um, just by one city al alone, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so none of these agencies uh, uh, would be a, a kind of fully uh, autonomous uh, alternative procurement agency like those that have been formed in Canada and Australia. Um, so I list a few here, a couple in Canada and a couple in Australia, um, that have been created to kind of manage this very different form of infrastructure procurement within their states. These are all state or provincial agencies. So all of these agencies are different, um, but they share some common characteristics. One is that they're not sector-based, uh, so they report either to the Treasury or uh, directly into the kind of uh, the state executive. Um, all of them uh, manage uh, infrastructure procurements that are that are completed using project finance or another kind of alternative um, structure for an infrastructure project. And these agencies are really designed to have the internal resources uh, and and um, and uh, capacity to manage those alternative procurements as opposed to traditional infrastructure procurement, which is very different. Uh, they also all have a uh, an, an important role in reporting. Because project finance involves a long-term contract, um, reporting is especially important uh, both on, the, on a programmatic level uh, and uh, these agencies issue specific reports on their projects. Um, and so to kind of explain the trend of Canada and Australia adopting this procurement model at a faster rate, which we talked about earlier, uh, all those projects were procured by organizations like these. So what to, to do about this situation in the United States? Well, we have a few uh, policy recommendations, um, if, and these are specifically relating to federal policy. Um, so federal support for mega projects is especially important, uh, especially projects that cross state or other institutional lines. Um, lending support programs that are already in place or that are ramping up uh, um, for project finance loans uh, are also a helpful uh, policy program, and these are, are already in place. Um, enabling uh, project finance-backed uh, projects to access the municipal bond market is also uh, a good fe federal policy, um, and there's been a, uh, some of these are in place and others have been proposed. Um, more importantly, I think the federal government's institutional support uh, for, um, for state and local governments uh, is especially important. So the um, Build America Bureau, uh, which is newly formed, uh, and the Transportation Investment Center, uh, these are both um, uh, programs that help state or local governments uh, transition um, uh, uh, or use this procurement model, and they, uh, they distribute essentially best practices. So those are, are strong initiatives. And then perhaps most importantly, um, one of my big uh, federal policy recommend recommendations is to uh, create programs uh, that fund projects based on the practices or innovative uh, programs as opposed to just the economic benefits of the project itself. So the new uh, grant program at the Department of Transportation, the Infra Grant program, is I think is a, is a step in the right direction. Uh, I think uh, that program could be significantly expanded uh, to even provide um, uh, funding support for infrastructure programs, uh, like the creation of, uh, of a new infrastructure agency, um, as opposed to just supporting an innovative project. So now um, I'll spend a few minutes talking about our, our, our uh, specific case study uh, for today. Um, this is the uh, case of the, the Long Beach Civic Center, which is currently under construction. Uh, I really like this project because it illustrates a lot of the concepts 
uh, that uh, I've, I've talked about in terms of the project finance basis. Um, it, it illustrates some procurement concepts for how cities can use this procurement model. Uh, and it, 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 it's a good case for a lot of the, um, the topics that we'll talk about in my course. Um, so this project is essentially to um, tear down and replace a, uh, the city hall. Um, it's going to tear it down. It's going to, the project will build a new city hall to replace it. Uh, the project will also develop a new uh, uh, headquarters for the city's port authority, a new library, and a new public park. Um, and uh, once that project is um, developed, the company that's building it is going to be responsible for uh, operating and maintaining uh, the, uh, the buildings themselves uh, for a 35-year concession. Um, and the total um, financing costs for the project uh, were about just over $500 million. So what made this um, uh, project uh, a successful procurement? It's, it's still under construction currently. Well, the, the reason the city was replacing uh, its uh, city hall uh, was because back in 2005, the city determined that it was seismically deficient. So the building was about 40 years old, uh, and it was rapidly uh, decaying, and the city determined that they needed to replace it because uh, it didn't meet seismic code. Um, the city didn't replace it initially, uh, but they conducted some studies. And in 2013, uh, the city chose to uh, start pursuing a public-private partnership. And I think there's a few reasons uh, that the city chose this procurement model as opposed to uh, traditional infrastructure procurement. Uh, one is that the first uh, municipal building P3 in the United States was also developed in the city of Long Beach. Um, so as a, as a uh, a, a researcher on institutional development uh, within the uh, infrastructure industry. I think that's a, a, an excellent trend in that the, uh, the, the city that procured the uh, second uh, uh, project using this procurement model was, of course, the city that, that, that had the first uh, use of this procurement model. Uh, the, uh, another uh, factor that led the city to use this uh, project finance to develop it, this project um, was that the, the existing facility was deteriorating at a much r more rapid pace than the city expected. So there was a real deferred maintenance problem. So when the city first uh, came up with the cost estimate to uh, rehabilitate the old building in 2006, um, uh, they came up with an estimate, and then as they were considering options for the redevelopment of the city hall, they had been escalating the cost to rehab the old building at 5%. Uh, in their, in their uh, internal estimates. When they reassessed the building in 2013, their estimate, uh, they, they found that an additional more than $30 million of deferred maintenance had occurred uh, on the building. So the building was deteriorating at a much more rapid uh, rate than they originally expected. Uh, the third factor uh, for this project, and probably the most important uh, in, in um, kind of driving the city to, to use this procurement model, is that the city simply calculated uh, their annual cost to maintain the old facility. Uh, so they came up with an estimate that they were spending around $12.5 million a year on the old facility, and the city essentially just went to the market and said, uh, we'll spend $12.5 million a year and no more uh, on, the old, on the new facility in terms of an annual payment, and they was, they, uh, the city said it would index that to inflation. So how did the city eventually get a much larger project for that same annual payment? Um, so in, instead of just re a replacement of the city hall, uh, the project is going to build a new Port Authority building, a new library, and a new uh, city park. Um, well, part of the factor there is that the old facility was sitting on a lot of unused public land. So the developer of this project, once they complete uh, all of those other facilities, they're going to be permitted uh, to um, develop some residential and uh, commercial real estate on some of that unused public land. So the city effectively used some of that unused land to offset the capital costs of developing a new city hall. Uh, one of the other important factors for this project uh, was a, a performance-based maintenance requirement. Uh, 
So the contractor that builds the new facilities is going to be responsible for maintaining them in the long term. And there's specific per performance requirements in the contract. Um, I highlight a couple on this slide. Uh, for example, elevators uh, and, and elevators out for maintenance was a big concern of, of city staff. And so there's a specific requirement in the contract uh, for the contractor to essentially uh, repair elevators that are down for maintenance quickly. And if they don't, the city's payments are reduced. In fact, if, um, if enough elevators are out, then the city can deem part of some of the upper floors of the city hall not available and does not pay rent effectively on that part of the building. Um, the maintenance requirements also have a handback requirement at the end of that 35-year uh, concession. Uh, so essentially, the Facility Condition Index, or FCI, uh, has to still remain 20% uh, at the end of that 35-year period. So that essentially means that the building will be 20% uh, deteriorated. Um, to put that into context, um, the, the old building, which was about 40 years old, uh, had an FCI of 52%. And the library, uh, the old library that's being replaced, had an FCI of 73% uh, at the time the project started. Uh, to put those numbers into perspective, those are clearly in the, the teardown territory uh, for a, a public building. Um, and so the city, at the end of the concession period, uh, will um, be able to inspect the facility to make sure that it meets uh, that uh, FCI of 20%. Uh, the last aspect of this that I wanted to highlight was the city was able to tailor uh, the contract um, based on the different public agencies involved in the project. So as I mentioned earlier, the city was having a deferred maintenance problem. So they transferred more of the maintenance responsibility to the private contractor. Um, the port facility is also um, going to be maintained by the contractor. Um, but the port didn't have the same uh, maintenance problem on its existing assets. And it wanted to um, perform more of the basic maintenance uh, using its internal staff or contractors. Uh, and so for the port building, the contractor is really going to be more responsible for major maintenance uh, and rehabilitation as opposed to uh, minor maintenance. Um, the other, of course, unique factor of this uh, project is because it's funded via an, an annual availability payment, um, the city effectively doesn't make uh, payments on the city hall or library facilities until they're uh, constructed and the cities, uh, they're kind of turned over uh, to the city. Well, that was my, uh, my case and topic for today. I, I, I hope it was useful. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about these concepts, our, our website's gpc.stanford.edu. Uh, and uh, it would be, it'd be great to turn it over for some questions. Thanks. Uh, Mike, as need for water infrastructure funding increases, do you think bond funding, less than $50 million, will be in higher demand? Also, do you think bond financing and community involvement, community members participating in bond financing, will increase? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I definitely think that, of course, as, as there's increasing uh, demand for infrastructure um, uh, investment in smaller projects, um, most of those projects, and, and most infrastructure generally, is going to use traditional procurement. Uh, and of course, that, that could entail some bond financing. So I do think that, that it will increase. Um, in terms of the, the other um, uh, uh, part of your question, just focused on project size. Um, so this procurement model is used in the, the water sector. And there's also some uh, other forms of alternative procurement in which uh, it, it would be used for a long-term maintenance contract, but there wouldn't necessarily be private uh, financing. Um, and so, and I think those uh, procurement models uh, will increase as more um, water utilities kind of turn to um, uh, to, uh, to kind of long-term maintenance contracts. Um, you know, in terms of project size, as I mentioned, this procurement model is generally used for smaller projects. I, I put uh, $100 million as a good floor um, just to illustrate the complexity of the project. Um, where there is an opportunity for smaller projects um, is in project uh, bundling. So that would be a case in which 
multiple utilities that require an investment effectively um, b bundle their projects together and procure one contract for, for all of the investments. So that would be the real opportunity for, for project finance uh, for those smaller projects. Great. Thanks. Let's take another. So uh, we have a participant asking, are certain types of infrastructure projects more successful when using the P3 models? Um, and he's given the example of uh, statistics with toll roads, airports, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so uh, in general, I would say um, the, the uh, projects that entail more risk uh, are better suited to this procurement model. Uh, so a project such as a toll road that has, um, has uh, funding risk, if there's not enough drivers for the road, um, that entails additional risk, and therefore this procurement model is, is a strong fit for, uh, for that sector. Uh, airports is interesting. Um, is a, a, the, the, I mentioned the U.S. is an outlier uh, for this procurement model, and airports uh, is the one sector uh, where the U.S. is probably the largest outlier. So most um, airports uh, that are, um, it, you know, in, in other international developed economies have been financed uh, using project finance. Um, and in those cases, um, the, the remuneration uh, for the uh, investors in the airport are essentially, of course, the, the airline fees uh, that use the airport, but then also um, things like uh, parking uh, or uh, rents from the uh, vendors in, in the airport. So um, there isn't necessarily uh, any single sector uh, in which this uh, procurement model um, is, is a particularly unique fit, um, but uh, in the U.S. at least, it's mostly been used for, for toll roads, as I think the, the asker uh, mentioned. Great. So do these Canada or Australia P3 agencies have any special process for expedited environmental approvals? You spoke about them in your presentation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I don't think they necessarily have, have a process for going around traditional uh, environmental approvals. Um, they do have kind of the expertise to manage the local uh, environmental processes um, in procurement. Uh, so essentially um, to uh, make those assessments uh, during procurement. I also think they do some programmatic uh, level work. Uh, so just for example, um, Infrastructure New South Wales uh, uh, developed and maintains a 25-year uh, infrastructure plan for, for the state. Uh, so that kind of long-term perspective, I think, uh, can assist with kind of environmental approvals and planning by simply laying out the, the actual needs um, uh, specifically. Oh, great. So it looks like staying in the global perspective, can developing countries, an example like Indonesia, emulate P3 approach for the large, pro large projects that you're presenting here? Yeah, and, and developing economies actually use this procurement model um, uh, fairly often. Um, so that's, uh, that, that trend is, is uh, more a phenomenon of multilateral bank policy. So um, uh, several multilateral uh, lenders, uh, like the World Bank, uh, require that project finance be used uh, for some of their infrastructure projects. Um, so developing economies can certainly uh, use this procurement model. It's been used in, in Indonesia even for um, some smaller um, uh, infrastructure projects there and for uh, more recently for some very large projects. Um, I guess the, uh, the requirement really is that in using project finance, because uh, the investment is really based on the project's economics, um, and not the um, balance sheet or, or credit of the sponsoring government. Um, for this procurement model to be used, there's just uh, additional scrutiny on the project itself. Uh, so uh, in order for this to be used in a developing economy, uh, the government there would simply have to uh, adequately uh, appropriate funding for the project. Uh, so in that way, project finance can be uh, almost a tool uh, to create additional uh, scrutiny on the project itself to make sure that the project economics and risks uh, make sense. Great. Um, this one specifically is looking at your case study that you presented. Who were the equity and debt investors in the Long Beach example, and what guarantees did they have against project cancellation? Or asked another way, who bore the development risk? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a, a really good question, and, and if you uh, if you may have noticed uh, on my slide showing the uh, completed and canceled procurements, there's a lot of development risk, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, to answer your question more specifically, uh, the I believe the the contractor for Long Beach uh, is an infrastructure developer uh, called, named called Plenary. Um, and so they would be the equity. I believe they actually arranged private financing um, for, uh, so a private uh, loan um, for uh, financing the project. Uh, and that was just based on uh, their assessment of, um, of uh, the best way to finance the project um, for them. Um, in terms of development risk, it is a, it is a, a considerable factor and the companies that procure that um, compete for these projects um, do bear some development risk, mainly because, as you can imagine, uh, the cost for them to compete for the project and develop proposals is, is quite high. Uh, I, I'm not sure of the specifics for Long Beach, but I believe they included a stipend uh, for essentially if they um, cancel the project, uh, then the companies that were competing for it get a small payment uh, to kind of uh, uh, recoup their uh, the, their costs uh, for pursuing the project, and that's fairly common um, for one of these procurements. Uh, and it's a good practice for government to incentivize competition. I think. Okay. Um, let's see. So P3s look very attractive for long-term projects until the many states face the challenge of blended state and local funding requirements, as well as moving much of maintenance to operating budgets. How do you suggest P3 success for a blended funding model? Yeah, that's, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, and I, I think it, it certainly is a, a, a big factor. It's um, you know a great example uh, of uh, state and local governments, I think, that are, are really tackling that challenge would be um, Fargo, North Dakota, currently. Um, so they're, they're, they're um, currently procuring a, a um, a flood protection P3 uh, and project, and um, they're they're really going through the the process between there's two states involved, multiple municipalities, uh, and they're really going through the process uh, to kind of determine who pays for what uh, and blending that funding. So the answer in terms of multiple funding sources or funding coming from different pots is essentially uh, through the project development process those disparate agencies uh, have to, to come together. Um, a good, another good example might be uh, Partnerships Victoria, one of the agencies in Australia I mentioned. Uh, so they have a practice that for one of these complex procurements, um, they, ha they form a project board. Uh, and Partnerships Victoria sits on that board, uh, but so do the other agencies uh, and sources of uh, funding that are um, involved in the project in any way. And then the board is kind of uh, how those agencies communicate and uh, develop all the agreements necessary to complete the procurement. Great. Well, thanks so much for all these great questions. Here's <laughs> another one. Considering this model is fairly new, I'm wondering if there are any statistics on average financial performance of the project from each stakeholder's perspective? Um, yeah, there, there are um, uh, some uh, aggregate statistics uh, that are published. There, um, in some ways, uh, though there's not, mostly, of course, these are uh, private investments, so there might not be uh, necessarily be returns um, uh, that are reported uh, by some of the companies or funds that um, uh, that invest in these projects. So some of that information is privately held by companies, of course. Um, but there are some uh, industry publications that um, publish data on, for example, the, um, the, the funds that have been raised to invest in infrastructure um, or, um, and, and for some specific projects, um, there's also um, the public agency that procures them uh, might um, publish uh, funding support, so for, for data like revenue uh, as opposed to investment returns. Thanks. Um, it sounds like a lot of effort needs to be invested up front to create the detailed contract, considering there are several stakeholders. What about the overhead related to enforcing the contract? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent point. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, the, using project finance um, has higher transaction costs 
uh, for completing the procurement, and those are those costs that you mentioned in terms of um, sorting out the, the project the life cycle plan, essentially. Um, so there, there are additional uh, transaction costs. And so when a government considers this procurement model, essentially, if, if you break down the assessment to its, most sim its simplest form, uh, what they're doing is they're, they're essentially valuing the risk that they're transferring to the private partner, and they're weighing that against things like the added transaction costs to complete the procurement, or um, if the project has a higher cost of capital using project finance, which it should, um, they'll, be, they'll be weighing that. So they're weighing some of their costs against the risk that they're transferring through the procurement. Um, and then there was there a second, uh, oh, the overhead to enforcing, that, that, that's an additional uh, uh, cost as well. In general, uh, most of these uh, projects are, are procured using a performance-based uh, contract. Um, but there's, um, and so most of the contracts that use this model essentially permit the government to conduct an inspection to make sure that maintenance is being spent or require the contractor to regularly report uh, their maintenance activities. So there are some costs there. Uh, I, I think for a lot of these projects, it's that, that cost in particular is relatively low, but it really depends on the project itself. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, even broader question here from this participant. What will be the optimal GDP percentage a company, I mean a country, should assign to its infrastructure? Do you have a yeah, take on that? Here's the, <laughs> so it's, uh, that's, uh, that topic uh, is, I mean, if, if, you, if you read academic literature on infrastructure, there's a lot of economists that uh, have, have spilt a lot of ink <laughs> uh, on that topic in particular. Um, so it, 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 it does vary widely. Um, there's some interesting studies actually coming out of um, China uh, now, mainly because um, China invests a much higher percentage of its uh, GDP in local infrastructure um, than really any developed economy. Um, and part of that is because China's, of course, been um, rapidly urbanizing over the last uh, few decades. But there you see, um, you know, as a percent of GDP, I, I think it's getting up towards 8%, whereas the U.S. Is between, has been between 2 and 3% uh, of, of GDP. Um, I don't, per, personally, I don't think there's necessarily a, um, a right answer. I think a lot of, um, a lot of the um, discourse in academia or in public policy has been about targeting that appropriate percent of GDP invested in infrastructure. Uh, when, when really um, infrastructure projects really justify themselves based on their microeconomics, not macroeconomics. Um, so the specific impacts of a particular project really need to be uh, assessed in order to determine if it's going to be uh, economically beneficial. Uh, but that at least might give you a little bit of a range uh, in terms of the U.S., which is on a low, the kind of the low end, it's between 2 and 3% towards an outlier on the other end of, of you know, upwards of 7% of GDP. Okay. Um, all right. If so we have a participant asking you to speak about P3 for aging energy assets, such as central plants. Yeah, this is, um, it, so project finance, I, I didn't, you know, my discussion uh, today was really focused on, um, you know, public infrastructure, so transportation and social infrastructure. Uh, but for energy, project finance has actually been used uh, in the United States and globally uh, at, a, at a pretty, at a much higher rate. Um, so for a P3, for an aging energy asset, um, I think that the, the, the problem or the, what would need to be addressed uh, in procurement is really the source of funding uh, for, for the project. So if, if it's an aging infrastructure asset that requires rehabilitation, um, the, the government or sponsoring body for that uh, procurement would really have to identify uh, a funding source. Um, so that might be, um, if it's a, an electric utility, it might be uh, part of its rate base um, or, or some other source of funding for the asset. So it certainly is, has potential, um, but really it comes down to identifying that revenue stream for the project. Okay. So do all public private partnerships include allowing the private entity to have infrastructure that they can monetize. If there are other options, can you elaborate? 
That's a lot of talking. <laughs> right. We um, get a lot of questions. Yeah. So um, thanks. <laughs> um, so in in general, um, mm -hmm. the using project finance, um, you know, all of the the cost to develop an asset and maintain it for the long term, you know, are are accounted for. Um, so I guess to answer your question, um, the, using this procurement model, uh, it, the project has to be fully funded, uh, and the um, the private company that wins the contract, and also importantly the um, the financer, fi the source of debt financing for the project is going to really scrutinize this project to make sure it's fully funded. Um, so uh, by that metric, there, the, the, you know, there, there, there has to be a source of actual funding for a project that, that uses this model. Um, and uh, maybe I could clarify uh, just that um, for using this procurement model in almost every case, uh, the private partner isn't doesn't uh, get ownership of the infrastructure asset to monetize it. So usually it'll just be a long-term contract. Uh, in some cases, uh, the, it's, there's you know privatization, so the they'll, the asset will be transferred in ownership uh, to the to the um, contractor, um, but in most cases it's not. So, um, but I guess to answer your question, yes, it's uh, yeah, there 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 does have to be a source of funding if project finance is going to be used. Yeah. What is the strongest, the strongest case to be made that government has incentive to keep infrastructure supply in balance to demand? How can it do so without the use of prices? Yeah, that's an, um, an interesting question. I mean, there is a, a whole industry uh, in and around estimating the economic uh, benefits uh, of infrastructure. Uh, development and but those, that's a obviously a um, you know part definitely there's a lot of science there but uh, there's also a little bit of art in terms of uh, estimating the benefits to a government of developing a new project it's it's difficult to tell um, you know I, I think uh, in for some assets um, you know there there can be um, pricing so I think I do think that's part of the reason why um, projects that are funded by a user fee uh, as opposed to um, uh, general taxes. Uh, it might be a more efficient um, way of generating funding for infrastructure because the people that benefit from the project are the people that pay for it. Mm -hmm. Now I think um, there, there should also be general public um, you know, support or funding support for infrastructure, so projects shouldn't necessarily uh, need to be uh, just using toll roads as an example, they shouldn't necessarily only need to be funded um, by tolls because um, you know toll roads also improve uh, the economy and you know improve uh, commute times. Just to use this as an example, um, for people that don't necessarily drive on on the toll road, uh, and so because of that, I think there's definitely a case for um, general taxes, but. Uh, to to uh, get to your question about um, the use of prices, that's why uh, a lot of economists have recommended user fee uh, funding for for um, toll roads or other infrastructure because it does give a um, a, a direct indication of demand. Okay. Um, do you have any examples of grid modernization projects that use P3? Um, yeah, there, so this is a relatively um, new sector. I would say I, I don't have a, a, a very good example in the United States um, of a, 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 a um, kind of a grid modernization um, project. There are some related projects. So um, the state of Michigan uh, recently um, procured a contract to essentially um, upgrade uh, the, its um, lighting systems uh, on its fruit some freeways around Detroit. Uh, so that would um, be a, uh, the, the source of, of funding for that project is essentially the energy savings that the state's going to have over the long term. Uh, and I think the, the city of Washington, D.C. is also uh, in the process of procuring a street lighting project. Um, Chicago uh, has recently procured a, um, a street lighting P3. So I think that's a kind of a related um, grid upgrade or pole upgrade. Um, project with a clear source of, of, of funding through cost savings. Um, so that would be a, a maybe a proxy. Okay. 
How about elaborating on infrastructure financing for energy, especially distributed energy resources or EV charging? Is that yeah. Um, so there, there, there have been. Um, uh, so the, I guess the the trouble with more distributed projects or EV charging uh, projects for cities, there have been some smaller uh, contracts uh, to do that in the U.S. In general, I think those projects to really use project finance uh, or to be procured as a public-private partnership, um, they 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 usually have to be bundled uh, in order because uh, they're they're generally kind of for smaller uh, scale projects. Um, but uh, um, it, it, the procurement model could certainly be, be used uh, for those. Um, I think the, um, it, it, so for new technologies like these, sometimes um, this procurement model, um, it, it can be slower to be adopted. So in this case, you know, if, if there's an EV contract or kind of a, I believe it was a distributed energy um, kind of a, a project, um, so the, the the most likely source of revenue there, of course, will be you know energy fees from users of those EV charging stations or um, from the community, and so because it's a relatively new sector, it's kind of hard for companies to really forecast uh, that revenue. Or um, so, uh, in some cases, I, I would imagine for an EV project, uh, if a if a city wants to pursue the, one of those using a public-private partnership. Uh, they might they might be able to transfer some of that demand risk um, to a private partner, um, but also potentially guarantee some payments uh, over the long term for the project. So it, it, it's possible, but it's difficult for some new technologies to really um, assess demand. It looks like we have time for about one more question. Who is the right expert to help develop legislation or a ballot initiative to create an optimized version of the Canada Australia Special Procurement Authority to encourage P3s? Seems like a good question yeah. to end on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's interesting. I mean, the, they're um, you know they're, they're, it, I, there's um, lobbyists for the infrastructure <laughs> industry, just like there are lobbyists for for every industry. And um, you know, there's there's certainly um, experts that have um, have kind of uh, looked at um, the you know U.S. federal policy and ways to incentivize some of these. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I think there's um, there's some some expert groups uh, out there on infrastructure policy. Um, you know, I guess one of the factors, of course, is that um, you know the the agencies I mentioned aren't uh, necessarily uh, federal agencies, although there ha there have been um, some good programs created, like the Build America Bureau uh, at the federal government. Um, you know, these are state level agencies, so. Uh, it's not necessarily DC that um, requires uh, some convincing, um, but I think uh, like uh, those state-level agencies in Canada and Australia, um, you know, once once they were formed uh, and they developed a track record uh, of operating history, um, you know, they they really kind of uh, took off from there. So I I, I think we'll we'll see uh, what happens with our state-level agencies here in the U.S. and and um, and and one of them might go out on a limb. So, yeah. Great. Um, with that, we want to just thank you so much for your time today. We hope you enjoyed the hour and encourage you to check out all of our offerings at scpd.stanford.edu. And again, don't forget, you'll be receiving a recording of this webinar to share with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for taking the time to attend, and have a great day.